I'm a classic millennial and the fact that like Captain Picard is my captain, period, end of discussion, the end. Right. Um, I was drawn to specific like archetypes within Star Trek. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know what I'm talking about. So like I loved Spock and I love Scotty. So I love Data and I love Geordi. Like right. those are my people. <clears throat> I'm going to love like the automaton, very logical, very cold. And then I'm going to love the engineer. Like those are my people. Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. Join me as we embark on exploring those futures we were promised, but which never arrived, with special guests who will share the predictions of the future that inspired them as children. So let's go to our guide, that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome to another episode of Days of Futures Past where I chat with special guests about what inspired them as children in the past, um, science fiction and future predictions and what could have come true but didn't. Today with me I have Christina Garnett, a customer-centric leader whose experience spans across Fortune 500 companies, startups, agencies, higher education, non-profits and small businesses. She's also a fractional chief customer officer who is deeply curious about the customer experience and social listening in general. Christina, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, me too. I know that we've had kind of sort of bouncing ideas and yes. conversations on uh, Twitter before about science fiction. I think our last one was about The Thing. Um, yes. Yeah, which is the absolute epic movie. No spoilers it's, if you've never seen it, but yeah. It's my favorite horror film. Yeah. Like it's, it's just second to none. <laughs> Um, but let, let's start off with yourself because I mean you recently yeah. just um, pivoted almost or, or certainly you yes. were in HubSpot for a very long time and now you've gone out on yeah. your own as a as a fractional chief customer officer so what does what is that exactly yeah so I, I left HubSpot I at HubSpot I ran the advocacy programs there so when we're trying to look at like who are the fans how can we take care of them how can we create new opportunities and programs to really highlight them and, and delight them in different ways. Um, and I wanted more. I wanted to be able to like be a part of the journey that helped build those fans in the first place and really kind of sit across the entire um, org. And so I left to start my fractional CCO firm called Pocket CCO. Um, I'm not a fan of the fractional term, but it's what you have to essentially mm. brand yourself as because we know what that means. Um, but basically the way that it works is... Um, the my ICP, my ideal client profile is agencies and startups because they're not likely to hire a full time CCO, but they need someone who's essentially that person from the beginning of the customer journey all the way to the end. And either they renew or they leave who's standing up for them and saying, like, this is the problems are having. How can we make this better? Where are the gaps? So like Cliff notes is I'm Lorax, but instead of speaking for the trees, I speak for the customers. OK. Now, now, speaking about trees and Lorax and, and something completely different in a way, uh, yeah. But, yeah, AI seems to be the hot topic of the day. And everybody yeah. and their aunt is throwing AI and chatbots uh -huh. in front of the customer experience, which to yeah. me um, is the wrong thing because you're yeah. literally in, in putting a technological barrier in front of a very human experience. Uh -huh. um, but as we've seen, you know, with uh, DPD, for example, um, okay. And uh, I think there was a car, a car firm as well, where you could negotiate uh -huh. the car down to zero if you wanted to buy uh -huh. it. Um, it just seems to be fool's gold in a sense. It's this gold uh -huh. rush, but nobody really understands. I mean, what's your opinion on this? I think that AI has its place in technology, but I think we're using it for all the wrong things. We're trying to completely replace the human instead of getting rid of the tedious things that people don't yeah. want to do. Like the fact that AI is being used for art really hurts me because what you're doing is you're, you're replacing the artists in the world with art made from AI instead of the other way around. AI should be making our jobs easier and more efficient so that we have more time to be creative. We have more time to actually create the things, create the art. And so I think that it's a really strong issue that a lot of companies are having to deal with. We're seeing a lot of brands who were saying, 
hey, we've made really great strides. We're making all these record profits, but we're still going to have to cut people go. Like Wayfair just did a layoff. Mm, I saw that. There's, there's tons of layoffs that have been happening this year. And some of them have even been like predated by the onus that, hey, we're actually doing really great, but we want more. Mm. So you're on the chopping block. And so I think what's happening is with the layoffs with AI, what you're seeing is that customer layer is being completely automated. And that's going to impact the customer experience. Absolutely. The problem is that there are ways where it could actually be really helpful. And that's where you're giving an option of choice. Mm. Because there are people who'd like, hey, I can self-serve. I just don't know where something is. And I don't want to have to wait for an hour to talk to somebody human. If you can just guide me through the game theory level so I can find out, like, if I press three, I'm going to be able to get the information I need. That's where we should be using AI is where, like, convenience is the biggest pain point. But you still need to give them the option. Do you want to talk to a bot and do it yourself? Or do you want to talk to a human? Let them choose. Mm. Let them choose the experience they want. And that way you're you're giving that option. They can deviate and go to self-serve. So you're you're taking the weight off of your success team. But also, if they do need to talk to a human, you're not trying to throw them off. You're giving them that immediate choice. And I think that more brands need to do that. Let them have the choice. And then they can do whatever they want. And there will be people who choose AI. There mm. absolutely will. But there are some people, especially when they're really angry, when they're really angry, I'm going to need to talk to a human because only a human's going to be able to empathize. And I also need somebody to yell at. Yelling at this bot is not hitting the hit. You know, like it's not scratching the itch that I have. And so you have to let them choose, but you're going to see more and more brands automating and automating and automating, and you're going to see more and more people losing their jobs. And for me, I'm not an econ major, but who's going to spend the money if we're all out of jobs? Mm. Like, how does the economy work if AI does all the work and all the people are just trying to figure out what to do and they can't make art now, they, they can't copyright for a living, they can't do automation workflows because you're going to continually see this like overreaching growth of AI. And so it's, it's, mm. it's not, it's not ideal, but I think you're going to see, you're going to see more pushback <laughs> and you're, the customer is going to push back, which is hopefully going to be the thing that changes things. Yeah. I completely understand your point about empathy as well, because, you know, after, you know, I had a bereavement, a uh, family friend bereavement, and I've had to deal okay. with as executor um last year yeah. and that's been a very long process and <laughs> thankfully there's been a human at the other end of of every phone call which is yeah. great but i just can't understand how anyone would want to automate you know those kind of processes that like you say you need someone you know you need someone to vent to or you need someone with a sympathetic ear to understand your situation just like debt um yeah. you, know, where, you know like um, debt management and things like that the last mm-hmm. thing that you want to do is explain your situation to a chatbot who's going to give you three options pay up get a debt or, you know get a bailiff mm-hmm. uh, on your door or or get high charges or something like that so yeah. uh, you know i completely understand that point there on your other point about the the sole economic factor as well i think i think what a lot of people don't understand is middle management is going to be um, a real problem in these in these organizations as well because if you are automating so much of the low level work you don't really oh. want to be paying lots of highly you know high salaried middle management to be, yep. basically babysit a chatbot or an ai or uh-huh. an algorithm so yep. there's going to be this kind of sort of weird uh-huh. ladder effect where some of the rungs yep. of the ladder are going to disappear and in the, in the effect of that it's actually going to make career progression quite hard because you yeah. don't have the experience I, I, to get that up yeah. to the next level. Well, I'd argue that's why you're also seeing a lot of people go independent is because the career yeah. ladder is broken already. And what's what we've really seen is um, across the corporate spectrum, I've had a lot of people who've reached out to me since I left. And I was quoted in a Forbes article about how I think more people, I think entrepreneurs are going to be born this year mm. for multiple reasons. I think that the, the career projection, um, the career projector, yeah, let me cross that, let me start over that career growth is almost impossible. You have really strong, intelligent, hardworking people and they're hitting their ceilings without any real advice on how to get there because what's on the other side of that ceiling is being corrupt, backstabbing, being in cliques, grabbing drinks with certain people. Mm. And so 
what we've turned into and what corporate truly really turned into is, and what you're seeing with this AI push is that humanity is a line item. Yep. Empathy is a line item. And companies have proven that anything that's a line item can be removed without discretion. Mm. And so now you're seeing other people choosing their own path. And so what that's going to do, hopefully, is it's going to create a way to balance that line item issue with the need of humans. So you didn't want to pay someone full time to do all this work and get benefits and get RSUs, whatever. But then if that person leaves, instead of paying them for 40 hours a week, what if you hired them as a fractional lead, a fractional CMO, a fractional whatever, or a contractor or a freelancer? Mm. And now you're getting concentrated hours. So instead of them paying for 40 hours and maybe like 20 of that was really hard labor and the rest of it was like meetings or just like goofing off and existing, you're getting concentrated work for specific hours that you need to take care of the core priorities that you have. And then it's going to be a lot less money. But that means that those people are able to charge more per hour. So they're actually like it's creating an opportunity for everyone, every side to win. Mm. And so I think you're going to see this blend of AI growing and taking on a bigger role in the office. But you're also going to see the role of the fractional, the freelancer, the consultant. You're going to see the rise of that go incrementally larger, too, because that's the human side adapting. So just as like the AI side is adapting to how we work, the human side has to adapt too. And that's why people, that's why a lot of people are leaving corporate. There's no such thing as loyalty. There's, they've proven it. So oh, yeah. go, go do your own thing. Now you grew up in the eighties, um, yes. which mm -hmm. uh, was a great decade. I have to say it's probably one of my, it fa is it's my decade. favorite decade. <laughs> um, what was that like? Obviously, uh, you know, cause I grew up in the UK, you, you yeah. in the US, you know, a yeah. child of the eighties. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, what was that like and what, what kind of things inspired you back yeah. then in terms, you know, because you work in, you know, you work in tech, you work with startups. Yeah. So something yeah. back then in that childhood must have sparked your interest in tech and, you know, and, and new technologies and things like that. You know, what got you on that path? Yeah. So um, my dad's a bit of an Anglophile. So I grew up with a lot of, a lot of um, like British television shows, but I also, but he's also like a massive nerd. So I grew up with a lot of sci-fi. Right. So for example, like I grew up with um, Star Trek. Star Trek was really big for me. I can send you a picture, but I was three years old. I got to meet James Dewan. I got to meet Scotty. Love Scotty um, to this day. And so um, I love Star Trek. I remember growing up and we would watch the X-Files together. That was like our father-daughter date was watching the X-Files. Um, Watch the original series, Star Trek. Watch mm -hmm. The Next Generation. I'm a classic millennial in the fact that, like, Captain Picard is my captain. Period. End of discussion. The end. Right. Um, I was drawn to specific, like, archetypes within Star Trek. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know what I'm talking about. So, like, I loved Spock and I loved Scotty. So I love Data and I love Geordi. Like right. those are my people. <clears throat> I'm gonna love like the automaton, very logical, very cold, and then I'm gonna love the engineer. Like those are my people. And so, um, which is also very interesting going into tech because those those archetypes are very <laughs> much in the tech world. Yeah. Like you gotta be nice to the engineer and you gotta be nice to the logical person in the room who's like, no, just it's yes or no. <laughs> so that that worked. But I loved the transporter. I thought the transporter was such a brilliant idea um i took i even took a class in college it was like a philosophy 101 course and one of the one of the papers we had to write was assuming that you're in a transporter and the way that the transporter works is it clones you mm. so it isn't like it breaks you apart and puts you back together it's the old you dies yep. you're recloned at that period yeah. in time and the other thing what happens if it malfunctions and now there's two of you and you have to get rid of one of them? Is that murder? Is that suicide? And so like deep philosophical, when are you ever going to use this in your career question? <laughs> 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 so we're reading like David Hume and then we're talking about transporters and like killing yourself. Um, but I always love that idea. And then um, because I mean, he was an Anglophile, I watched Doctor Who before realizing it was Doctor Who. So my dad is 
the best way to describe him is he is Sean Connery in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Like, that is my dad. It's how right. he acts. It's how he dresses. Like, that's my dad. Um, this should have been a professor somewhere. Should have been, like, surrounded by books in, a like, a dark office in Oxford somewhere. Um, but because of that, he loved Hammer films. So, like, I grew up with Christopher Lee. I grew up with Peter Cushing. So my first doctor technically is Peter Cushing's doctor, which is not canon. Hmm. Because so it was a movie, was first, wasn't it? It was a movie, yeah. yeah. And it has it has <laughs> yeah. um, Bernard Cribbins in it. So Wolf, he's in it. Like, yeah. he's young. Um, so it's kind of in the ecosystem, but it's not technically canon. So I grew up with that. And the TARDIS was later on when it got rebooted, and I, and I got to see it with, like, Christopher Eccleston and David Tennant and all of those, um, I fell in love with the TARDIS because it kind of felt like this amalgamation of um, Star Trek's Transporter, but also, like, H.G. Wells's. Um, the time machine mm. and so you have this like beautiful blend of i'd love to go in all sorts of time i'd love to go anywhere in the world and in the universe and the tardis is like I, why don't we do both why don't why don't we do whatever you want and so absolutely fell in love with that and i think that that's something that we're also seeing um especially when it comes to time there's that um there's that entrepreneur who's trying to like de-age himself do you Brian know what i'm Johnson. talking about yes yes i find that you're it's very interesting to see how sci-fi is playing out in today's world because time mm. has t has over and over and over again proven itself to be the clear limited resource. Yeah. Like money and all these other things are one thing, but time is the one thing that you mm. don't get back. And so you're seeing all of these um, initiatives to de-age. And you see this out of the tech spectrum. We see this in beauty. We see this in beauty industry. You're everyone's trying to look 10 years younger than they were everyone's trying the new eye cream and neck cream and all these other things we're all we're all fighting time which i think is very interesting and i think that that's the whole thing with ai too is how can we do it faster how can we spend less time doing this how can we ship it immediately and so i find that that time tends to be that one kind of anchor in what is that motivator that no one's really saying is a motivator it's it's always time do you think time then is the cause of the, the root of all problems as well, rather than money? Because we're obviously trying to cheat time and cheat death. We are trying uh, to cheat it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not letting go. Well, I think it's I think it's very human to fight back mm. and to fight back things that we really are literally the underdog at, and time is the one thing. We, we can't figure out. It's the one thing we keep trying to come up against, but I think we're going to continue fighting it because it's the one thing we haven't controlled yet. We yeah. love to control things. Humans love to control things, and we can't control time yet. There is a, a physicist, um, and he's <laughs> actually been driven by his dad who passed away, um, well, and he's been working on this for the, as, as long as I can remember, which is about 20 years, um, yeah. to try and create a time machine out of lasers. Um which is really interesting and, and uh -huh. um, but there's always that conundrum where you can only travel back to the point where the time machine was actually created and it's a bit like that kind of um philosophical conundrum especially with the yeah. transporter which i have yeah. to ask you where did you land was it suicide or was it murder uh, i landed on suicide yeah. right because it's interesting because star trek has dealt with this a number of times obviously yeah. um in the original series Trent, mm -hmm. um, Kirk was split yep. um, a couple of times and then Riker in The Next Generation where there were two of them yep. wandering around the, the universe um, so mm -hmm. it is actually quite interesting I remember reading, I think it was um, Lawrence Krauss who did the Physics of Star Trek the book mm -hmm. um, and I remember reading all about the, the fact that well, you're not actually moving one person from one end to the other you're actually destroying yeah. the original Yep. And then creating a copy. But then, of course, you're beaming the copy back up and destroying the copy and creating another copy. And at one yep. point, does it just not become you? It's like Ship of Theseus. It's like yep. not you at all. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. None of the planks. None of the OG planks. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's fascinating. But I think it's also interesting, too, especially when we talk about the tech space. I feel like we have to talk about Black Mirror. We have mm. to talk about the Twilight yep. Zone. Because it's interesting how the nerds, like, I feel like we all watched and read and did all the things and we're like, that'd be really cool if we saw that one day. But we also, some of us, myself included, like, we also read a lot of Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> like, yeah. I've been warned. I've been very <laughs> clearly warned. 
But I feel like there's also this like tiny little percentage of the world who saw all that stuff and was like, oh, I can build this now. And I'm like, you missed the entire point. Mm. The entire point was it was a warning. And you're like, oh, shiny, I'll make that. And that's what's really weird with all of these different products that are being shipped and launched and, and really kind of brought to the public. And it's like, that was a Black Mirror episode. Yeah. That that was a Black Mirror episode. Like, why why did you... why Like, you're reading it, like, watching it for the plot, but the plot is like, I'm stealing all of the ideas. <laughs> it's like, the problem in sci-fi is never the ideas. Like, we've had all... Like, you can't say that there's a, there's a loss of ideas when you have Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and Gene Roddenberry and all of these, mm. like, worlds that have been built. The ideas exist. Some of them have not been created because it's not possible. Others have not been created because... It's, it's just genuinely not going to be a good thing. And they've told you, the people behind the lens who've said, like, I've seen what this looks like. And I think, I think anyone who's watched Oppenheimer, sh I feel like that was, the, that was the one part of Oppenheimer that I, like, it's a masterpiece. But I absolutely loved that part where it, every time it showed Einstein, I just wanted to hug him. Because he is that voice mm. who's like, I'm smart enough to know what this can do. And because of that, I don't want to be a part of this. Yeah. Because of this, like, just let me, just let me back away. Do you think um, going even further back from the 1980s then? Because, I mean, a lot yeah. of the, a lot of the 50s and the 60s, or even earlier, to be honest, there were visions yeah. of the future. There were illustrations. There were books written where we had no concept of what the limit was. Yeah. So, you know, um, someone else mentioned on, on a podcast earlier about the atomic ashtray. Asimov loved yeah. his atomic stuff and he had yep. the atomic ashtray, which would vaporize the ash. And it's just like, well, that's overkill. Why would you want an atomic ashtray? But, yeah. you know, back then in the 60s and the 50s, everything was the atomic age. And, yeah. and I don't know if you've seen Hello Tomorrow mm -hmm. on Apple TV, but that, that's brilliant. Yes. It's, it's great about that kind of future. And it was very bright and optimistic. And like I said, there were right. no limits. Do you think that's kind of hampered us now where we can't think beyond those limits because we know what those limits are? I think that it, it comes from a mindset of, like if you're thinking about the 50s and 60s, we're thinking about like post-World War II. Mm. They, they literally thought the world was gonna end. And, they, and then they're like, nope, we actually are gonna rebuild. We're actually going to build and prevent this and do whatever we can to prevent this from happening again in the future. Meanwhile, us, we had our own kind of apocalyptic moment with COVID. Hmm. And instead of it bringing us together, it kind of showcased how willing we are to destroy ourselves and then like tweet about it. <laughs> yes, I'm going to film the apocalypse. The ap yeah. But that's the thing, like in the fifties and sixties, it's like we have all these new ideas, we're gonna rebuild the world. Like we we like you said, we're coming with this level of optimism. And instead, ours is it's bad, we'll just turn it into content. Yeah. Which is which is really wild. But I, I think it's this amalgamation of all of these kind of symptoms that we have. We've our our coping mechanism is to live on this like social stage. Like, yes, my life is falling apart, but I can make a TikTok about it. Like, yes, this is happening, but I'm going to go and, like, freak out and write a thread. Like, it, it's wild. But I think that there is this, like, this sense of negativity about everything that we've created. Hmm. And, it, and it feels like we're trying to create, not to make some, the world better, but to create because we have limited time. Like, it's like everyone's trying to build their legacy. For better, for worse. Like I want to, I want to be the person that did this, instead of, is that actually making the world a better place, or do you just want to be go viral? Mm. You know, and which I think is really sad. But I also think that you're. I think that that those that lack of limits is because we saw. What humanity could do in a bad way, and we've really kind of showcased it as a warning, like. As a Gasimov, and you have Red Serling and all of them, they have very powerful ideas of what the humans are capable of for better and worse. Mm. And they put them together. Like, I feel like the Twilight Zone is such an indictment of humanity, if you really look at it. 
but it's such a powerful place to showcase what is possible for better or for worse. And then you have Black Mirror that's doing it in the same way, but now it's from that scope of what does the world look like when social media is this animal that we, or this monster that we've all accepted into this world. And now it's not leaving and it's kind of corrupted all of us to the point where we want to be seen, we want to be heard. And even in like the darkest moments of our life, at least we can like shake our fist and be heard in some way. But, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but I think, I think that it also goes into play that you have to understand that everything is like, I joke that every tweet is a subtweet. Hmm. And I feel like every piece of science fiction is a sub science fiction tweet. Like it's all, we're all building off of each other. We're all reacting to something else. Like I think Star Wars is such a perfect example of this where when people say Star Wars shouldn't be political. <laughs> and I'm like, well, first, <clears throat> wars. <laughs> it's in the title, the clue. It's in the title, just a <laughs> tiny little clue. But then also, like, George Lucas has been very open about the fact that, like, this is an indictment of the Vietnam War. Mm. Like, if you look at the rebels and how they're, like, having to be scrappy and not having a lot of materials and not having all these things versus the Empire, it's, it, like, it, the dots fill in themselves really quickly. And you're like, oh, we, we are the bad guy. Oh, we're the bad guy. But the bad guy never realizes they're the bad guy. Mm. They think they're making the world better. They're organizing things. Like if we were in control, like none of this would happen, not realizing like you're the baddie. So I think, I think you have to look at sci-fi from that lens of it's a critique of something else. It's building off of the work of something else. Um, that's why it's weird when like founders, they'll talk about how they created something. And I was like, Gene Roddenberry did this like 70 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and he told us not to do it. <laughs> he told us not to do it. He specifically warned us. Kirk had an entire monologue. Where were you? <laughs> Where did you go? Like, why did you hear that? But it's things like that. I think that, um, I think that's why we kind of lost our way. Do you think we need more we optimistic sci-fi then? Or certainly optimistic visions that people can sort of get behind? Because, I mean... You know, you mentioned Rod Sterling and, and, and Twilight Zone, and then you mentioned like Black yeah. Mirror, which is very kind of, um, yes. you know, it was the definitely darker the version. darker version. You know, <laughs> Twilight um, Zone plus depression. Yeah, <laughs> but of course, everybody took the, took Black Mirror as the, uh, the the instruction manual instead. Yes, um, but I think what the, I think the, and sometimes it had the the optimistic outlook at the end to give like the little parable at the end or whatever, um, well, or the little lesson. But I think what's missing from most of these right now is this is a thing the thing is bad this is what's going to happen when the thing goes bad uh -huh. but there's we're missing that step in the middle that says and this yeah. is what you need to do to avoid the thing and this is what's yeah. going to happen when you avoid the thing and what the mm -hmm. world's going to look like and it seems to me that we're stuck in that this is a thing and this is the, what happens when it goes bad and yes. like you say, this whole negativity side of things, especially with social media fueling everything and the mm -hmm. pandemic just created this massive divide again, you know, people saying, well, COVID's a, a conspiracy. It doesn't exist. There's no vaccine. The vaccine's wrong, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I think that kind of fractured oh, civilization entirely. Uh -huh. But how do we, how do we almost re refuse or infuse optimism back in again? And then give yeah. people that agency to take the next steps towards a more positive future. Yeah. That's a valid question. That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, I think we're definitely stuck in this cyclical cycle of dystopianism. So someone, someone has an idea. They see the world from a specific lens. They, I'll take Hunger Games, for example. Mm. So they'll, they'll write the Hunger Games. They'll um kind of create this messaging and then people will see that and they'll steal like ideas from that and then that kind of gets incorporated into their life like hey why don't we do this and then like we steal from the world that feels dystopian we create dystopian literature then we steal the ideas from the dystopian literature and encaps like so it's like layers on layers on layers mm. on layers on layers and i think i think it's a few things we have a 24-hour news cycle so it's incredibly hard to stay positive in the world because like dirty yeah. laundry, yeah. like the song encapsulates it. Like that's what sells, blood sells, like death sells. 
Um, that's what's going to make people want to talk about things. And so what we've created is this consumption engine based on negativity. It's why on Facebook, they gave you an angry emoji because, and that honestly is going to propel your content more than something that people like mm -hmm. because our, our need, our, our hate and our anger is a more powerful emotion than love for better, or for worse, at least on social. And so if you want to create good content, if you want to do all these things, you're going to be more likely to create that negativity, that dystopianism, that like fear mongering, that's going to create the virality that you want. And so we as a society need to understand why are we championing and amplifying the worst of us, mm -hmm. even if it's in critique. So like I was watching, and this is very minor level, but it, it kind of gets the point, is I was watching the Chiefs game last night um, for their division title and Taylor Swift is there. And Taylor Swift is a very polarizing figure in the NFL because like she gets good numbers. They they show her all the time. And mm. then there is an entire swath of NFL people who would think that Taylor Swift is murdering the NFL live in the like in the halftime show. Like she's killing children, like she's a witch, like all these like I literally saw these tweets where it's like her witchcraft. We we gotta stop it. Like, oh my god, it's right. It's wild. <laughs> um so Skip Bayless who is an ESPN commentator who thrives off of what I'm talking about. He runs his mouth. He's, mm. He does cold takes. And he lets him stand. They're published, engraved, all the things, because he loves the attention. And so Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift's brother, I mean, boyfriend, his brother Jason, who just retired from the Philadelphia Eagles, he, like, Travis scores. And so his brother goes out of the box bare chested, like looks like a Viking bear <laughs> and is like beating his chest, drinking beer, like whooping and hollering, screaming, cheering, all the things. And it was hilarious. Like all of Twitter was talking about it. Like, I love it. Like I watched that. I was like, <laughs> Jason for president. Let's go. <laughs> like, I love the energy. Um, and so Skip basically says that Jason took a page out of Taylor Swift's self-promoting playbook and decided to do all this stuff. And I was like, sir. You were going on Al Gore's internet to promote yourself <laughs> by talking trash. <laughs> but I have to be in that moment and be like, I'm not going to quote tweet him. That's what he wants. Mm -hmm. Even here, I'm talking about him. I'm giving him exactly what he wants because even in critique, I'm, in, I'm saying his name out loud. We just got to like Voldemort rule a lot of these negative people. Like he must not be named. And just don't, <laughs> don't give it air. <laughs> just don't give it air. And then they, they eventually don't get the attention they want. And then they just kind of like disappear, hopefully one day. But it's things like that. Like we, we really encourage the worst of humanity, be humanity's behavior. Because mm -hmm. we assume that if we shame them, then that's enough. But they don't feel shame. They feel attention. Mm. And so they're like, oh, everyone's talking about me? Okay, let's go. Let's, let's more of that. More of that gasoline on the fire. And... We, we are encouraging the dystopian loop instead of looking for optimism because optimism doesn't, optimism doesn't win. Optimism doesn't get the shares and the clicks and the links and the clickbait that the dystopianism does. And that's why. And I don't know how to fix that other than like, please ignore them. Well, I wish I knew how to fix that as well. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if, we go, if we go back to like um, what you do and then the customer side of things as well then. I mean, yeah. how... how, how taking that kind of sort of utopian or certainly the more positive aspects of what we want to do you know mm -hmm. how do we how do we use technology to to make the customer experience better then because we yeah. you know we started the conversation about ai and putting ai in front of it and that's obviously quite bad especially if you want a a, a situation where the customer needs a, an empathic response yeah. so it can't be in there all the time but how do we implement technology in the right way to enhance the customer experience rather than making it worse you need to audit the full customer journey it's not linear first off like a lot of people struggle because they want to make it fit in this nice little like path mm -hmm. and that's just not how humans operate we we get distracted we come back we find you in different ways we all of these different things you need to audit the full customer journey and you need to figure out what the current customer experience is and you need to figure out what does 
bad, neutral, and good look like at each of those stages? Because a lot of people are doing an okay job, but they are treating it like they are doing a great job. When maybe you don't have enough competitors Mm. or maybe you're the cheapest in the market. So all you got to do is just not piss them off. And there's a difference between not pissing someone off and delighting them. And that difference is the moat. That difference is what's going to make them sticky for you. And so figuring out where are those like major experience moments across the customer journey to figure out is this an opportunity where we need a human or is this an opportunity where we need something to supplement and figuring out what that looks like. And then you have to, because what people think is what can AI do? I'm going to have it do all those things instead Mm. of what has to stay human. And then we guard that. And then what's left, then we can figure out what AI and other tech can be a part of, but you have to, we're doing it in the opposite way. What can AI do? They'll do all of that. And then we'll plug in humans with everything else instead of the other way around. You have to be very protective and hold the line of what has to stay human. What has to be empathetic? Because there's going to be like workflows that you can create where you can personalize the emails and you can do the drip campaign and it's fine. That's great. I don't, I don't need that personal touch. But when would I want one? Hmm. When would I need one? When would one feel extra special? And so, like, when I was at HubSpot, you do all the things, but I made a point to talk to people. Like, I would slide into pe- in people's Twitter DMs. I would talk to them on LinkedIn. I would, where can I be human with people so they know that this is me? And I even had some people be like, hey, are you, are you, are you using, like, a tool in your Twitter DMs to, like, reach out to people? I was like, no, this is just me being ADD and, like, talking to everybody. <laughs> because they're like, oh, you took that extra time. Because that's the thing, too, is... When you add a human element, you're adding the touch plus their time. So going Mm. back to like, if this entire thing has a theme, someone giving you their time when you realize how priceless time is, is a huge investment. It shows you care. It shows that like, I didn't have to do this, but I made the time for you. That's incredibly special in a world that's trying to put an AI in front of everything. Hmm. Who's trying to make everything more efficient for you to sit down and be like, let's sit down, let's talk, let's take that time. That's really personal. That's really, really personal. And so thinking about what parts of that journey need to feel that way is huge because a lot of people, like a lot of people who are pissed off, it might be something that you literally can't even fix. It's just like the nature of the problem. Like, mm. hey, I'd love it if you did, if Apple did this. And Apple's like, that's a sci-fi concept. We'd love for that. Like, we've tried. Can't make it. Like, we literally tried. Some of the times those people just need to be heard. And like the de-escalation is listening to them and taking the time to de-escalate and listen to like, why are you so excited about this? And why is the lack of this making you so angry? Is there... Is there a problem that it was solving that you can't solve any other way? Maybe there's an opportunity for us to brainstorm with you. Maybe there's another way of looking at this that we haven't thought about that maybe it's something that is possible, but you don't know if you don't take that time. And customers want to feel special. Uh And as brands get bigger and bigger and bigger, the ability to feel special dwindles really, really aggressively. So if you put things in place that can make those people feel seen, It's huge because otherwise what you have is the salesperson has a calendar invite for three months before the renewals due. They haven't talked to you since. No one's talked to you since unless you did like a support ticket and then it's only support you talk to. No one's talking to you until you have like this very strict schedule that they have in place to prep for the renewal. They make time for you when it sales Mm. is up. They make time for you when you're a part of quota. They don't make time for you once you've gotten on the other side of that sale. And that's what I think is so important about chief customer officers is having someone be that voice to be like, I'm actually in the room. You can ignore their email. You can't ignore me. I'm in the meeting with you right now. And I'm going to advocate for them. And that's why you need that chief customer officer. That's why you need that person in the room because that person can't be ignored. That person's going to be very annoying, <laughs> very loud. I, mean, like, I can't hey. imagine you being that at all. <laughs> I'm very annoying. <laughs> Just like poke them over and over again. Hey, 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 it's me. But that's true though. Like you need someone who's going to, like you've, you've dismissed their emails or you did the bare minimum and thought mm. that that was enough. I'm going to be the person in the room that's like that, 
that was an okay experience. That was not a great experience. So let's not treat it like it was a great experience. You didn't win anything there. You, you barely saved that relationship. And all they need is something that's a little bit cheaper or something that's a little bit better. And that's the thing with AI. How many people have like created these AI startups that do almost all of the same things because they've mm. all like put a hose up to open AI? Yeah. It's an immediate red ocean. So how do you differentiate? If it's AI and it can do all of these similar things, the differentiator is the human. The moat becomes the human in an AI world. That is actually a really good point to, to finish up on for the conversation. But I will ask you one more thing, actually, yeah. and, and we'll keep on the, 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 the topic of time. So you yeah. mentioned the time machine itself and obviously yes. the TARDIS. Yeah. But is there anything else in science fiction or any other past predictions of mm -hmm. a future world that hasn't come true yet that you w really wish you had today? Um... There's a lot. Um, I love the idea of, and this is not a technological thing, but it's something that technology made possible. The thing that I really loved about Star Trek is that you have peace. And there's the possibility of peace. Hmm. Like you see them getting along with Romulans and Cleons later on the down the line, and you're like, who under the backstory, how is this working? <laughs> Like, how is this a thing? And you have you have those moments that feel very human. Like, I love the undiscovered country because mm. it feels very much like this is how us normal people act. And there is intrigue and there are spies and there's treachery and there's all these things. But I love that we can get to the other side where there is this inclusivity and then there is this peace. And we are very clear about where we come from and that we've been to war with each other centuries ago. Um it's it's peace. It's peace for me. I think we have a few skirmishes left in us before we get to that point, though, don't we? <laughs> I think we do, sadly. Yeah, unfortunately. I think we do. But that that's the one thing that always strikes me is that you you look at the bridge and you have and especially like as as later generations happened, you have all of these archetypes which you could easily call stereotypes, mm -hmm. but we have all of these different archetypes who have all of these things that come to bear. They have these perspectives they're able to share. They're able to have one singular vision where they can work together and be a team. And they understand there's going to be animosity and aggression. And they're like, they they have photon torpedoes for a reason. Like, I'm not saying there's peace absolutely <laughs> everywhere. Like, they, they are technically military vessels. Um, but there is a sense of peace and a sense that, like, there can be peace between these different... Um, cultures that are very, very different. And mm. I, and I love that they, I love that they also leaned into a lot of those. Like I love, I love, love the Klingon culture and I love Worf and like all of his backstory and all of that and how they were able to tell that. And you have this like hyper aggressive oh. culture and then he's there, but he's having conversations with Data and mm. he's having conversation with Earl Grey drinking Picard. And it's like, this shouldn't work, but it works. And I loved the poker scenes. Like the poker scenes in Star Trek The Next Generation are some of my favorite scenes. Um, and then you have the Borg. You have the Borg is a big problem, and then you have Seven of Nine later. Like, mm. you have this earlier story of, of war and aggression. And then later on, you have a character that represents that culture, and they're, I don't want to say assimilated because we talked about the Borg, but they're a part of the team. And I think that that's really telling that you're even, even in that story of peace, you're seeing this evolution of there's going to be new bad guys, there's going to be new skirmishes, but in the future, you're going to see that we've gotten past that. Maybe we could do that with AI as well, where at maybe. the moment it's the bad guy, but maybe it'll be part of our culture, but in the positive way, who knows? But yeah. um, like you say, in a world of AI, be more human. Yep. Um, Christina, this has been great. Thank you very much yes. for your time today. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. I'm, I'm always down for a nerdy chat. <laughs> um, thanks again for joining us on this podcast of Days of Futures Past, uh, where I will have another guest on to talk about what nerded them out um, when they were children and what kind of futures they want to see um, coming true. Until next time. This is Days of
of Futures Past signing off when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now. <laughs>